we uh, specialize in educating the public as to how options work. One of the things that I like to talk about when I talk about things like the basics of calls and puts is I like to start at the very beginning and think about what optionality is more generally and what you can kind of glimpse from the background of these contracts before you start to dig into what they do individually. So let's talk about what an option is essentially. Options really are contracts that give the buyers the right to buy or sell the underlying asset and the seller then incurs the obligation of making that contract whole. If there were an exercise or um, an um, assignment event, the person who is being assigned on that contract is the person who sold it. The person who is exercising it is the person who bought it. Now, there are other parts of optionality that you need to understand within this, and we're gonna talk about this. Those parts are the specific prices at which these options are struck. So we talk about that specific price as the strike price, and options also have an expiration date. They have a life cycle. If you ever traded futures or if you've traded stock before, you understand that those things you can buy and they don't necessarily expire. Options, every option that you buy is going to have an expiration date. And thus there are parts of that that are built into the optionality that are inherent within that expiration date. So options really give you a, a very flexible way to express your opinion about the actual marketplace. They make it possible to really target a variety of investment objectives. We talk about this constantly when we're talking about options. We talk about the different ways you can use them. You can use them to, to reduce risk. Lots of people use puts in that way against an underlying long position that they have in a stock or an index or something that they might be carrying. Income generation, that is something that falls into the bucket of income generation, selling premium against that legacy position that you might have in an underlying stock. The other thing that people talk about when they talk about this is stock acquisition. This is something you're gonna hear when people talk about selling um, cash secured puts. It's a way to actually use the actual inherent option premium to generate a long position in the underlying at a certain strike price and buy an expiration date. Those are two of those things that are inherent within optionality that's built into every options trade. And then of course, there's always speculation as to whether or not people use these contracts for speculative purposes. We can't say whether or not they're actually speculative trades or not because we can't tell what they're actually doing with them. But this is definitely one of the things that's built into the marketplace and it's a healthy part of a functioning marketplace is people speculating with these assets. So options ultimately really offer you a ton of flexibility. You can use them in lots of different ways and lots of different, um, lots of different ways to like use cases as far as options are concerned. Let's dig into calls and puts specifically. Two types of options. You can really bisect the entire options world into two sides, calls and puts. As an options market maker, calls were always on the left-hand side of my screen and puts were always on the right-hand side of my screen. So anytime you hear me talk about calls, you're probably gonna hear me watch me use my left hand and anytime I talk about puts, I'm gonna talk, I'm using my right hand because that's kind of how I see the world and the calls and the puts side. For equity and ETF options, the underlying asset to be acquired or sold in this case generally is 100 shares of the underlying stock or 100 shares of the ETF. This is where leverage comes into play when we're talking about options. The reason why we always talk about leverage when we talk about options is that if you are trading a one lot of options, generally speaking, that one lot will control, in this case, 100 shares of the underlying. That you can see as the built-in leverage into these contracts. Trading a one lot of options allows you to control 100 shares of the underlying through the exercise and assignment process that we'll get to a little bit later. Let's talk about calls specifically. The call buyer owns the right to buy the underlying stock or ETF. Generally, they are bullish on the underlying. And as with any long option play, you need movement to counteract the decay that exists within this option. Options, as I said, have an expiration date built into them. Thus, they have decay. One of the factors that can overcome that decay, regardless of whether or not you're buying calls or you're buying puts, is movement, underlying movement, which can change the actual optionality of the option and can change the, the P&L of the option over time. 
Now, if you're a call buyer, you own the right to buy the stock or underlying. If you're a call seller, you're incurring the obligation to sell that underlying stock or ETF or index or commodity to the person who bought it. <laughs> OCC is the largest clearing corporation of options on index options and equity options in the United States. One of the things that people always ask when we're talking about options is, if I trade with someone and I exercise the contract, are they actually the person who sends me the stock? The answer to that is not necessarily. The way that OCC works is that it's a centralized clearing facility. And so as a centralized clearing facility, they step into the actual marketplace and become the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. So when you're transacting in the option space, you're actually technically transacting behind the scenes with OCC. And OCC acts as the guarantor for all of those contracts so that you don't have individual counterparty risk with the person that you've traded with. If you go to exercise your contract and you have a bilateral trade agreement and that person can't cover the actual, the obligations that they have incurred in selling it to you, what happens? If you have a bilateral agreement, it's broken. They don't know whether or not you can actually cover it, it becomes an issue. When you're dealing with a centrally cleared facility like the OCC, that goes away because the OCC is the guarantor of all of those contracts. So equity call buyers on the right to buy the stock, equity call sellers are incurring the obligation to make that contract whole and thus sell the stock. Now let's talk about the put side of things. Again, the left-hand side, right? The put side of things. Equity put buyers, conversely, own the right to sell the stock. So if you're buying puts, these are inherently bearish trades, especially if you're buying them, because puts generally have a negative correlation to underlying price. When prices are going down, puts generally are going up in value because they have that negative correlation. If you're speculating, it's a bearish trade, and if shares are already owned in this case, we think about it as buying protection. We think about it in this way as um, creating an exit for your long stock strategy or your long index strategy or commodity strategy. What you're doing is creating a price floor, at which point you can exercise your put and exit your position, your underlying long position. If you are a put seller, sometimes people have a hard time understanding this concept. If you're a put seller, you have the obligation to buy the underlying if you are, ex if you are assigned on that short put contract. If you think about it in this way, put buyers own the right to sell the stock. And if they exercise their contract and they go to sell the stock, they have to sell it to someone. So the person who is short that contract is incurring the liability to buy that stock and is thus going to be theoretically long the underlying after the exercise or assignment. All right, buyers and sellers, the, the rights and obligations that I just talked about, right? Buyers who are long contracts on the call side maintain the right to buy the underlying puts, they maintain the right to sell the underlying. Sellers of options, or what we call short options, on the sell side, if you're selling calls, you incur the obligation to sell the underlying, and on the put side, this is the kind of tricky part, some people don't necessarily understand this always, you have the obligation to buy the underlying because you are short the put. Always remember, calls generally have positive correlation to underlying price, puts generally have a negative correlation to underlying price. So call values theoretically go up when stocks go up, put values generally go up when stocks go down. So that's why they're used in those ways. In exchange for these rights and obligations, buyers pay a premium for the option and sellers receive that premium. This is always something that I talk about when I talk about options. When you trade options, the actual premium that is involved in the trade immediately goes into or is credited to your account if you're a seller or is debited from your account if you are a buyer. That premium never changes status in your account. Many people will watch their trades move in P&L terms and think that their actual trade premium is changing. Their trade premium is not changing. Call premium that you have bought comes out of your account and goes to the seller and premium that you have sold gets credited to your account and it never changes. What does change on a daily basis is those options that you hold over time get marked 
to different prices at the end of each day, and that's what creates your actual P&L on those options. So it's important that you think about that as a distinction. And those things happen immediately when you make those trades. When you're buying options, the premium actually comes out of your account immediately and never changes. When you are selling options, the premium goes into your account or is credited to your account, and that never changes either.